what I think does need a lot more discussion is the fact that they're not operating their terms and conditions and their policies purely to further the preferences of, of the woke management. Actually, a lot of what YouTube and Twitter do is not just encouraged by governments, but actively prescribed by governments in terms of filtering content and deprioritizing certain content in a sort of anti-disinformation campaign by the authorities. Hello and welcome to Reasoned UK, where the channel that asks you to think more and follow less. Now, I'm wearing my best prison attire for you today because it's looking like this channel might be on the way out as well. If talk radio is anything to go by, please do consider hitting that subscribe button and the notification bell, by the way, so you don't miss out on any future content because there might not be much more in the way of that. Now, talk radio is the fastest growing radio station in the United Kingdom, which hosts popular commentators like Julie Hartley Brewer, Mike Graham and Dan Wooten. They've all had their YouTube channel, Talk Radio's YouTube channel removed because they offered a platform to journalists and experts who questioned the efficacy of the UK's lockdown strategy. Now, as viewers of this channel will know, I am a proponent of scrapping the licence fee, but in the context of this debate, a nightly viewing of the BBC's News and Current Affairs programme, BBC Newsnight, that might reach an audience in the hundreds of thousands. In contrast, to YouTube's content creators and online-only platforms that reach far larger viewing figures. Figures like Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson are reaching the millions in each episode. And that, of course, gives these platforms a lot of power over the content we're able to view. If our Silicon Valley overlords decide we plebs cannot handle seeing an opposing view to what is the consensus of our political and media elite, it can quite easily just remove a platform from those who they disagree with. So what can be done about it? And is it quite as straightforward as it might seem? You know, can we just call on our politicians? You must do something. Stop this censorship. Protect freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Maybe not. I'm absolutely delighted to say that I'm joined by someone who has given me a lot to think about when it comes to this very issue. So hello to you, Victoria Hewson. Hi, Darren. Now, Victoria, you are Head of Regulatory Affairs at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Is YouTube using its dominant market position to silence alternative voices? I wouldn't quite put it like that. First of all, the question of its dominant market position is a a really uh, itself quite a difficult question around, you know, competition and monopoly and market dominance. We would have to get into a much more uh technical economic debate about what exactly is its market and how we define dominance and monopoly because there are lots of other ways in which individuals can access video content however in terms of being an online video sharing platform then clearly um youtube is the most dominant provider of um of of that particular service Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are they using that dominance deliberately to censor and restrict content um, either generally or more particularly from certain voices? Um, Again, that's uh, an interesting one. There's been a lot of criticism, I guess, from conservative voices or um, pro-Trump campaigners, for example, that online platforms, including YouTube, and I guess more especially Twitter in the US election, that they were adopting a very partisan approach. And I think uh, certainly with Twitter in the US election, I think that's undeniably true. Um, but are they are they deliberately sort of adopting a political approach purely because that's the prevailing view of the uh, the management, if you like, of those companies. I'm rather more doubtful of that. I think there, there is, you know, I guess a certain liberal bias, um, and I use the word liberal in, in I guess, the American mm. sense there, that does um, strongly pervade the, the policies of the platforms. But um, what I think does need a lot more discussion is the fact that they're not 
operating their terms and conditions and their policies purely to further the preferences of, of the woke management. Actually, a lot of what YouTube and Twitter do is not just encouraged by governments, but um, actively prescribed by governments in terms of filtering content and deprioritizing certain content in a sort of um, anti-disinformation campaign by the authorities. So I fear when people say the government needs to step in and protect our freedom of speech, I'm afraid that's quite naive actually, because a lot of the filtering of content that platforms like YouTube are doing is done in order to try and fall in with what the government wants them to do. Mm. And you know, currently there are lots of codes of practice about it. The EU has an anti-disinformation code of practice. It's currently voluntary and Facebook and Google, Twitter and others have signed up to it on a voluntary basis. But it's been made very clear by the Commission, the European Commission, that if they don't subscribe to this code of practice and if they don't implement it in full and provide regular reports on how well they're doing at suppressing disinformation in quotes, mm -hmm. then there will be binding regulation and the EU's upcoming proposals for a Digital Services Act to regulate platforms and, and the digital, digital markets generally specifically envisage putting this code of practice on a, on a formal yeah. binding footing. Yeah. That's interesting that you say that because I feel like that's completely missing from the debate right now because you're either on the argument of some people say it's not a threat to freedom of speech, you know, because it's a private business making a decision about how it wants to operate. And by the way, Victoria, it tends to be those who have um, left of centre views, who, who feel pretty safe and secure on these platforms. And then the other side of the argument, which is more conservative minded opinion, which is saying government must step in, repeal section, what is it, 230, and, and, and allow us to be able to speak freely. But you're saying actually, you know, sat in the middle of that, wedged in the middle of that, is a lack of discussion around what is actually driving platforms to do this. And in your eyes, it's not just, you can't just entirely put it down to Silicon Valley being lefty liberals, but I dare say, Victoria, they probably are, right? <laughs> well, I think there's research that shows that, you know, you know, polling... Of, of people who work in that sector does give a, a, a certain, um, you know, they do tend to favour certain political outlooks. I'm not entirely convinced that that has, you know, driven any particular policies and um, management decisions about who's allowed on the platforms or not. Um, you know, the, the very foundations of these platforms was very much um, built around f free speech and they only took hold and succeeded because they were making available content and, and voices that hadn't previously been able to to really reach global audiences before because not because of any particular conspiracy but, but just because the facility wasn't there for people to create content um and 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 broadcast it to to the world because you had to have a uh, a broadcasting license in in whichever country or jurisdiction you were in. So they, these platforms are built on free speech, but um, that is very much threatened. As I say, I'm not convinced it's threatened by the, the, the woke or, or leftist agenda of the people who work there. And, and I don't really think you can split this on party political lines either. Uh, you know, you, you, you are talking about conservative voices being silenced. I, I suspect people on the other side of the debate would argue that they also struggle to be heard. And let's also not forget that certainly in this country, our anti-disinformation online harms agenda has been led by the Conservative government and Conservative uh, politicians who, for example, chaired um, the, the the DCMS committee that has been absolutely, um, you know, rapidly calling for crackdowns on the, what they call disinformation and I guess what, what we might call um, free speech. 
Mm. So it's not it's not fair, I don't think, to to make it a, a party political or partisan political matter because it's more a matter of people who think that uh, disinformation, as they call it, or unauthoritative content or untrustworthy content should be removed and filtered and people need to be protected from it. And, and those of us who actually think it's very important that um, even untrustworthy and untrue content is heard and not suppressed. And, um, you know, when you think about some of the things that broadcasters were censoring and platforms were censoring early on in the COVID uh, pandemic, they had to, Ofcom made, uh, and the Advertising Standards Agency made broadcasters take down adverts for masks. Because at that time, mask wearing was not considered to be important and was actively advised against. Now, of course, prevailing scientific opinion is exactly the reverse of that. So who who was actually who was guilty of purveying misinformation at that time? This is this is the risk of um of, of trying to censor content that's perceived to be untrue or untrustworthy. So you think that's what's happened to talk radio here is that, you know, the EU's uh, code of practice on disinformation, they've fallen foul of that. And YouTube have said it's easier for us as a platform to just pull your channel than it is to, I don't know, start emailing you and telling, getting into a dispute with you around what content you should and shouldn't host. Or indeed the parameters of what is and isn't consensus opinion. Yeah, I wouldn't want to comment specifically on on the talk radio yeah. situation. I don't know really what the specific reason is for that. I haven't heard what YouTube have had to say about it. But what I would say in general terms is I am sympathetic towards people who say, well, it's a private company. They have their terms and conditions. They have their uh, community standards and they're entitled to to implement them as they see fit. I, I, I agree with that. It's important. Um, and the idea that you know, that they should therefore be punished and have additional liability as a publisher for that, I find quite difficult because that would actually disincentivize any platform operator from doing any moderation or curation of content at all. And rather than having thriving free speech and a, and a wonderful ecosystem of ideas, what you'd end up with then is actually quite a low quality experience because we actually do rely on platform moderation and curation. And, and algorithms to to give us a good quality experience when we use them. So, um, I, I I do sympathise with the argument that private operators need to be able to run their platform and operate their community standards as they see fit. As I say, where I do have the difficulty is where they might be saying they're doing it because they're just following their community standards, but actually those terms and conditions and operating policies have been driven by regulations and um, codes of practice imposed upon them by authorities. That, and by the, the, the European Commission in its latest review of its code of practice on disinformation specifically references as of September 2020, they specifically talk about how successful it's been in um, countering disinformation to do with the COVID crisis. Yeah, and disinformation could be, well, going back to the point you just made about masks earlier, right? That would have been seen as disinformation were you to be advocating mask wearing. But yeah, I now... mean, a similar was at, at the time, um, you know, back in spring last year, it was seen as very controversial to talk about closing the borders. And um, now, of course, everyone's urging governments to, to close the borders and why do we still have flights coming in? So it does show that, you know, scientific consensus changes and it would be very, very dangerous for free speech and for the advance, advancement of ideas that should be scrutinised and held up to debate to have some kind of authoritative version of the truth sort of crystallised and anything that um, questioned or sought to undermine that would would essentially be be filtered out and not permitted to be discussed. So just how having looked into all the various forms of regulation, and this is happening across the Western world. You know, it's not it's not limited to uh, Europe or the European Union. But if we look, for example, 
at the everything we've you've just said there, the way in which the marketplace of ideas is actually advanced by dissenting voices saying, well, actually, hang on, have you considered X, Y, and Z? And uh, free speech, free expression actually advances and progresses society. How much are you worried that actually this is p- imposing a real chilling effect on those values that we've we've sort of held dear for many, many years? Well, I think in, in one sense, it's, you know, we do have to retain a sense of perspective here because while YouTube is a very important video sharing platform and Twitter is a very important platform for very online people like you and me to share ideas and and discuss topics. They're not the only ways by which um, discussions happen and ideas are exchanged. And and perhaps actually what this should be telling us is that people, uh, you know, like yourselves who who are running uh, video channels, is that we need to be looking at diversifying how we do communicate um, and and using other platforms. But you know, we still have um, we still have the news media, newspapers, um, lots of other ways in which people exchange ideas emails uh i guess i guess the 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 really chilling thing here is that other you know the 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 most basic way that we would have had of communicating in the past would have been in person talking to each other and obviously that's do that yeah (laughs) um, um or certainly not beyond quite stilted formalized conversations like this one that you and i are having just now so i think when you take it all together you know the prohibition on gatherings and protests under the coronavirus regulations i think all of it taken together is actually very chilling and yeah. the idea that we can't question not question you know scientific advice but things like proportionality of restrictions and is the government being transparent with data all of these things are really important things and um actually would advance understanding and actually advance public acceptance because if people start thinking that um, dissent is being suppressed then that actually makes people more suspicious this is the issue with uh, people who are calling for anti-vaccination content to be actually criminalized so that if you um, you know um, communicate anti-vax sentiment or stories which you know may um, I, I you know i'm very pro vaccination let's let's be clear but i think the wor- the worst thing you could do in order to encourage people to be s- more suspicious of vaccinations and less likely to to embrace the need for um for vaccinations the worst thing you could do would be to ban dissent about it you just need to have better public information and education campaigns and more transparent information to counter anti-vax sentiment. Yeah, as soon as you cancel someone's right to speech, it starts to become more exciting and you start to think, well, why? what are they so scared of, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, you know, the better um, the information is, then the more likely people are not to go looking for... Um, you know, crazy conspiratorial stuff in in the dark reaches of of the web. Now, what do you say then to those who say this this isn't? It, Victoria might well be right on the fact that actually what's happening here is that in order to, of uh, I guess an attempt to tackle disinformation. We're seeing tech companies just finding it easier to remove content and and act, you know, act now, ask later, basically, than it is to to risk the heartache of some regulator from the European Union or indeed our own domestic regulator f- to get involved and say, well, actually, Sunny Jim, you know the rules. You shouldn't have uh, allowed them to upload that. This is on you. Um, and you are the publisher, essentially. It's starting to try and shift that, that argument. Mm. Is it being applied even handedly, even if that is the case, even if these it is regulation that's forcing these big tech companies to act? Because if you take you mentioned Trump's tweets, for example, it doesn't really seem to go the other way. It doesn't really seem, you know, if the New York Times writes something about the United Kingdom that I would argue 
is disinformation. If the BBC Radio 5, for example, put out a clip for, yeah. of someone speaking about uh, kids in hospitals and saying, you know, kids are basically suggesting that kids and coronavirus is a real problem in our hospitals. And a lot of professionals were saying, hang on a minute, you know, this is disinformation. And yet Twitter, you know, I didn't see any tag there. I didn't see any tag saying this claim is disputed. You, does it so, does it work one way is what I'm asking. There's a couple of points there. I'd say, first of all, um, you alluded to the difficulty of having platforms um, taking down content in order to protect themselves from liability. And if we go back, you know, a couple of decades to when um, web services were first really taking off and, and um, user, con user content sharing platforms, uh, you know, if you go back to the days of MySpace, for example, when they and um, old fashioned discussion forums were first becoming really popular, the US and the EU passed these pieces of legislation to protect the platforms from liability for content posted by users. And a lot of people think that that's a great benefit for the platforms and it protects them. But what they forget or what they neglect is that the most important thing about those pieces of legislation was that they protect the user from having platforms zealously censoring content in order to protect themselves. Because if you're a commercial platform and someone posts something that looks a bit controversial and it might be satire, but it also might be libel, you're not out of the goodness of your heart going to take the risk of being sued for that. So you just take it down, you filter it at source. Mm. And the so-called liability safe harbors, like um, under the e-commerce directive that we had in the EU and Section 230 in the US, that's what they do. They protect the user from being censored by platforms in order to uh, avoid their own liability, whilst also allowing platforms to do moderation and curation of content to take out, you know, really obscene stuff or stuff that's just not relevant and so that's why those safe harbors are so important they're not they're not so much there to protect the platforms from liability although that's what they do but they protect users from being filtered in order for the platforms to to not face um liability so that's basically so the think... argument in favor of before you go on that's basically the argument in favor of protecting section 230 right yeah. Yes, exactly. And and the equivalent safe harbour that we have, um, you know, now in our law in the UK via the EU e-commerce directive. And I think people who say, oh, well, um, to, to go to your, the second half of your of your point, mm. just that people who say, well, they're not being balanced, they're not they're, they're not being impartial. Therefore, they should lose this protection um, because they are favouring um, a particular viewpoint therefore they're a publisher therefore they should not have the protections of section 230 anymore that massively misses the point because if they if they lose the protections of section 230 it's the it's the users it's you and i who lose out because they will take a much more aggressive approach to filtering content than they currently do because maybe they do it currently uh, by way of a combination of um anti-disinformation regulation and a particular pervading worldview. But if you add it to that, that they would also face liability for um, for libel or, or whatever else it might be, then that, that's only gonna get much, much worse. So people who call for platforms to be stripped of their protections should really be very careful what they wish for, even if it does seem a bit biased and impartial, um, you know, that's, that's not great, but arguably we don't have to use Twitter. Um, we could all we could all get off Twitter and read some books, right? And then we'd get a much better um, experience. So you of say, well, we definitely would. Hell, <laughs> our life off Twitter would be greatly increased. But I, I wonder, what do you think about the... I spoke to Dennis Prager at the end of last year. And... Um, Dennis said it was analogous to basically, you know, getting on an airline. There's only one airline that goes to your this particular destination and you're carrying a copy of the Wall Street Journal, a 
Murdoch paper. And the airline say, I'm really sorry, sir, but if you're not carrying a copy of the New York Times, we're just not going to be able to let you travel with us. You would argue, actually, there are several airlines and it's possible to start an airline quite easily. Well, not easily. I, I mean, I assume you have to have a fair amount of dosh in order to actually get around the regulation these days. But actually, the marketplace, there is a market there. So it's not it's not, you know, one way street. Twitter's not the only game in town, for example, is what you're saying. Yes, that's right. If you define the market as the communication of ideas or um, a, a media platform, we do. It's not. You know, our media ecosystem is not as pluralistic as it could be, not least because of the dominance of the of the state funded um, BBC. But it's, it is more pluralistic than I think that analogy allows for. And actually, in terms of startups and, and you know, actually opening it to be even make it even more competitive. Unfortunately, the direction of travel, despite the fact that um, regulators and authorities in the US and Europe and in the UK are pretty obsessed about the dominance of the incumbent large platforms who are trying to, to break them up. Actually, everything that they do has the seems to have yeah, the, opposite. the opposite effect. Yeah. yeah. They bring in, you know, the UK is implementing, sadly, unfortunately, we are still going ahead and implementing the EU new audiovisual media services directive which re which will now regulate online video sharing platforms like youtube although actually because youtube i think is domiciled in ireland so they won't be regulated by ofcom in the uk but ofcom now will take over regulating online video sharing platforms, I think TikTok, for example, and, and a few others will now be regulated by Ofcom. You know, so the barriers to entry for startup potential future competitors just become ever greater because, you know, I just spent this morning reading the um, the UK implementation, the audiovisual media services directive, and it's pretty complicated. So you're going to need legal advice. There's a new burden, a new layer of regulatory um, risk that you have to um, allow for. All of this comes at a cost. And really, it just further entrenches the dominance um, of the existing incumbents like YouTube, who can just suck up all of this existing regulation, pay their lawyers and compliance teams a bit more. And, and they're fine and delighted with it. I hear what you say. I mean, the one pushback would be, if you look at the way in which especially younger people, the next generation, are completely rejecting the likes of the BBC wholesale, right? They they dominate, they uh, consume their news uh, through YouTube and Netflix. Now, if you consider that, and I go back to my Dennis Prager point, Prager U, for example, billions of views on YouTube, if they were to be pulled like talk radio has been, and by the way, they've been demonetized several times from YouTube. To be pulled from that, you can't immediately reach a new audience and sort of be able to, to be on, the, if I use the EU's favorite phrase, the level playing field with the left, which let's, I think there is evidence to suggest the left dominates the media um, I mean, traditional forms of media, the BBC especially, but, you know, traditional forms of media that being uh, print as well. So if we consider all of that and you consider that YouTube is the one ground where conservative thought has had a chance to try and have its arguments put forward and heard by the next generation. And you think, great, PragerU is able to, and reasoned, influence those areas and, and put forward those arguments but were they to be pulled completely you can't just think oh well i'll go to another platform or i'll just start a platform on my own website because you just can't get the same audience or the reach as you would on youtube so it does have real power so you can sort of sympathize with where people are coming from on that can't you i do and it is a, it's it's really an example of 
incumbents and establishment vested interest fighting back, right? So it's um, it's newspapers fighting back. Um, the newspapers somehow always manage to get little exemptions uh, um, for for their journalistic content. Mm -hmm. They some, seem to always manage to get carve outs from these regulations for themselves because they still have a very strong voice. They have the ear of, of politicians. So they manage to, to carve themselves out there, the sort of mainstream, um, what, would, what would you call it, dead, dead tree press. They, they managed to, to, to carve themselves out. And um, it's, it is very much a case of bringing everybody back to a sort of um, centralized, controlled media landscape that we used to have before the, um, the advent of all of the video sharing and um, user-generated content platforms and so in some ways this is not you know this isn't revolutionary this is kind of the way lots of businesses always go when um, incumbent voices have a lot of influence and try and regulate competitors out of uh, out of business or um, bring everybody back into a sort of center ground and um yeah I guess that's yeah. I guess that's where we are yeah so that I wonder then to end if you might if you might sum up for us just how much you think freedom of expression is in peril I mean you've been looking through the UK's own regulation online harms for a number of years now we hear more and more about people online being effectively cancelled in what I would describe Victoria and I don't think I'd put this too strongly as a return to sort of medieval witch trials you know it's it just strikes me as on you can be cancelled effectively cancelled quite easily and then in turn effectively deplatformed and i'm worried about the the power and i know that that many people watching this will be fascinated by what you've said but still very very worried about the power that these these tech companies do actually have now so i wonder if to end that would be my the first part of the question how much do you think freedom of expression is actually in peril by what we're seeing online, especially at the moment. And my the second part of that question, why then ultimately you still think that a rush to ask politicians to do something about this will royally come back to bite us in the arse, yeah. if I might put it so bluntly? Yes, so I do think freedom of expression is um, under threat not just because of these kinds of platform regulations, but also because of lots of other um, regulatory and uh, legal interventions that our government and other governments have in mind. You know, the, the UK, our online harms uh, proposals, or the, I think they're now going to call it the online safety bill, they're not just talking about video sharing platforms or Twitter, they're also talking about um, private communications like WhatsApp um, that they want to start regulating and keeping an eye on that people aren't um, spreading harmful content. And then we have things like the Law Commission's recent proposals about communications offences and hate crime, where they want to uh, overhaul the existing malicious communications act but not in a good way they want to make it uh cover even more uh protected characteristics and um actually make the offense much much worse and far worse for freedom of expression so it is it's under fire from all directions and when i say oh well we could all just get off twitter and read a book that's slightly glib because obviously we are all much more online now and we have come to rely on online communications much more. So the idea that um, well, we'll be fine because we can just write letters instead, uh, that's not really th the real world. And we are in danger of losing a lot um, if government and Ofcom and equivalent regulators start intervening on what we can say and threatening us all actually with criminal prosecution for saying things that are likely to um, offend or cause someone emotional harm, which is what the Law Commission has mm. in mind for uh, some new communications offences. But 
um, I would definitely agree with um, your conclusions there that we should be careful what we wish for because if we start if we start urging government to um, remove liability protections for platforms then that could actually be far far worse for all of us because um, platforms would just see that as carte blanche to censor content to uh, to protect their own positions yeah yeah well Victoria if people want to find out more about this where can they find some of your work? on these issues? Well, at the IEA, we have a book coming out very soon about freedom of expression. And I have a chapter in that about um, free speech online, which will be coming out very soon this year, I hope. Brilliant. Well, Victoria Houston, thank you very much for joining me today. Pleasure. Now, food for thought, definitely. I think you'll be absolutely desperate to hit that subscribe button now. But do comment below. What Has that changed your mind? Has that given you anything to sort of chew over? I definitely do think that freedom of expression, you know, as we've seen, viewers of this channel have seen over the past year. I was threatened with arrest last year for broadcasting an interview with a guest. And that, that just, that obviously chilled many people to the core. And that seems to be the road that we're going down. And that obviously is a real, real problem for the really important values of freedom of expression and all else. But we'll get there, I think, because I do think the tide is turning. People are starting to become more aware of this. People are starting to realise that there needs to be a bit of a pushback against this stuff. But let me know, have you changed your mind? Has Victoria given you any food for thought? And I'll see you next time. Reasoned relies upon grassroots donations from people like yourself that want us to continue producing our high quality free thinking content. So please do consider clicking the link and donating no matter how big, no matter how small, because it really does ensure that we can keep on keeping on.